Welcome to my mini lecture on Sam J. Miller's wonderful science fiction cli-fi novel, Blackfish City. And I'm entitling this mini lecture, The Future of Climate Change, The Future of Housing. One of the most provocative theses that emerges from this book is that climate change is not universal. It's a class issue. And I think this runs counter to how climate change is usually discussed in dominant discourses and narratives, as if climate change is this thing that's going to affect everyone. Rather, as this novel narrates, the devastating effects of climate change need to be read through the prism of class. It's important we think about the politics of climate change and the class of climate change, because again, as this book narrates, the wealthy will have an opportunity to remove themselves from those geographies most at risk and experiencing the most extreme forms of weather. Um, and again, this is conspicuous in the novel. But again, I think a, a claim that needs to be circulated and articulated more in today's society. One of the remarkable things about Blackfish City is that it's climate fiction, but it also could be read in different genres. It's a queer novel. It's a pandemic novel. And specifically the way it's a queer novel, I think, is really brilliant because its queerness isn't thematically conspicuous. It's not at the center of the novel, which to me is very progressive. I mean, too often, I think, in publishing um, a quote-unquote gay novel or queer novel, the queerness sort of saturates every page in a way that it's telegraphing for non-gay audiences. But these characters, many of them are gay or queer, but it's just enfolded it, it into their life. It's not this explicit theme that characters are discussing all the time. But Miller is proudly gay. He's openly gay. And many of the characters in this novel are queer, including a non-binary non character, Sock, who uses the third person to refer to themselves. And again, this is um, ahead of its time, right? It's become obviously very pervasive now. But when Miller was writing this, and when it was published in 2018, you think two years ago, um, I don't think that many queer characters were using the third person and discussing themselves, especially in a novel that's marketed as a climate fiction novel. Again, this isn't marketed as a queer novel. It just can be read as such, and it is such, right? Um, the, also, the breaks, it's a very clear metaphor for the HIV virus. Um, you know, that should be explicit within the first 20 pages. So in that sense, if you're reflecting upon this novel, we could think about how um, how this climate fiction novel is also a pandemic novel, which resonates greatly with the contemporary moment, of course. Um, and of course, the breaks predominantly affects the LGBTQA plus community, refugees, and the poor. And there's so much to say about the politics and class of this pandemic, and again, how it relates to climate change. One of the reasons I selected this novel for this for our class is because Sam, Sam J. Miller is not just a novelist. He's also an activist, and his day job was as an activist. In an interview that he gave on August 12, 2016, this is two years before the publication of Blackfish, Blackfish City, um, he was interviewed because of his work and how he, how, he, how he manages to write fiction on the side. And the interviewer asked, quote, tell us about your work as an activist and organizer. On a related note, how does your work influence your fiction? To which Miller responds, I work for an organization that was founded and is led by homeless people. And my job is to magnify and amplify, amplify the voices of people experiencing homelessness to fight for social change around the negative laws and policies that impact them. That means a lot of protesting the NYPD, who since the 1990s has made pushing law-abiding homeless people out of public spaces its prime directive, and a lot of fighting City Hall, which is in the pockets of big real estate and has no interest in creating housing for very poor people. I've been doing it for 12 years now, so I imagine it's influenced my fiction in a million ways. I think this is a great opportunity for your own reflections to think about Miller's work as an advocate for the homeless and how this book is also could be read within the genre of, of, it's not really a genre, but it's about poverty and homelessness and the crisis of, crisis of housing. For more than a decade, Sam J. Miller, and this includes while writing Blackfish City, worked for Picture the Homeless. In his bio, 
um, when he worked there, and he just stepped down recently. It says, quote, for nearly 14 years, Sam has worked with Picture the Homeless to organize New York City's homeless community. Sam is the communications director of Picture the Homeless, but he has served as their housing organizer and later as lead organizer. Um, and then it talks about his work outside, his his writing life. But again, um, you know, in contrast to so many authors that are full-time writers, which is, you know, amazing, but that's such a privilege. And I think it's so important to turn to authors who do have day jobs, who are politically active, not just for how that informs their work, but I think for those of us who aspire to be creative writers, as a type of model that it's possible that having a full-time job, whether that's as a teacher, working in a nonprofit, working in the corporate world, we could still carve out time to write what I consider an amazing novel. And again, here we just, there's just an image of him um, at work. As I said, he, uh, he retired only last year. This is a year after Blackfish City was uh, published, and it's a, sort of a thank you letter for how meaningful he was to this organization um, as an organizer um, and for all the work that he's done. Um, I, I just uh, another uh, uh, interview from Miller before turning to the novel more specifically, uh, he claims, quote, well, I'm not trying to smash the system via somewhat subversive stories. I'm trying to smash the system by organizing poor people to fight collectively for social justice. I spent 15 years as a community organizer at Picture the Homeless, where I played a part in organizing a billion of, of a month billions of amazing protests and events, helped overwin 120 policy and legislative victories, and I coordinated the writing of a major report that was required reading in urban planning courses at Columbia University and was banned in New York State prisons. I'm also a member of the Community Funding Committee of the North Store Fund. So much to unpack here that obviously it's really important, but first and foremost, he is an activist. And one way to, to, to gain purchase on this novel, how, is, how can we read this literature as a form of activism? What type of awareness is it, is it doing? Um, and also the fact that he's aware of the politics of knowledge, how knowledge circulates. Um, that, well, the, the fact that he wrote this major report that's required reading but was banned in New York State prisons, who has the power to prevent knowledge from circulating? And again, this becomes thematized in Blackfish City. Um, but just like an amazing uh, role model, I think, as a human being, working directly on policies to work for social justice and creating fiction on the side that's doing the work of social justice, and the two need each other. So for the time we have remaining, I want to think about this novel, briefly look at its style, because it's so, I think it reads so quickly, and it's such an engrossing narrative, but it's also dense, because so much information and so much politics need to be unpacked. But I also want to highlight the geography of this fictional um, world that's been destroyed by climate change. So the novel unfolds on Kanak, which is an eight-armed asterisk. And it's important to think about the geography of the space to understand the social relations that unfold within. Um, we read on page five, quote, almost a million people call it home though many are migrant workers who spend much of their time on boats and harvesting glaciers for freshwater ice. Fewer and fewer of these as the price of desalinization crystals plummets, working Russian petroleum uh, rigs in the far act are Arctic. Um, a few things to highlight here. Uh, first and foremost for this course is that we're ending where we began. Uh, this is set in the Arctic, um, going back to South Pole Station. I may ho Hopefully that was a pleasant surprise, an unexpected return to what was once um, an uninhabitable space for the most part. The appeal of the Arctic is, as we see, we see the working class majority living in horrifically impoverished conditions. Um, they're harvesting for fresh water. One of the crises of this future of climate change is not only just the drowning of the major um, cities throughout the world, the vast majority that have been built on coasts, but the crisis of water supply. So uh, again, being in the Arctic with some fresh water is, is, a, is a major benefit. But we also see the class crisis, which is prevalent in every paragraph, but we have to read closely. If we look at the conditions of these millions of people that live on this makeshift uh, city-state, 
we can't admit that there, a world of oil is unimaginable. Yet many of the workers are working on Russian petroleum rigs, which suggests that there remains a caste of wealthy who are far removed from this space of poverty and hustle. So again, we could see a class conflict, but what should be telling is that the capitalists are absent. In conjunction with the need for water, um, the other great advantage by the Arctic as a place to live is because of something that was we probably don't think at all about in the, the contemporary moment. It was absent from South, South Pole Station, which we get from this quote on page six. The central hub is built upon a deep sea geothermal vent, which provides most of the city's heat and electricity. So again, we it's without being made explicit, this is a space that doesn't have access to natural resources we take for granted, such as oil and coal. Instead, it relies on a geothermal vent and the Arctic in the future becomes prized real estate for the warmth it could provide using the, the Earth's natural cycles and rhythms. I want to say a few more words about the geography of class in this novel, in this city. Um, as we discussed previously, this makeshift city is comprised of eight arms. Eight arms one, two, and three are where the wealth is concentrated and the other arms are on the other side. So we have to read class both horizontally and vertically. Um, and we'll discuss that as we read this quote on page seven. On arms one and two and three, glass tunnels connect buildings, buildings 20 stories up. Archways support promenades. Massive gardens on hydraulic lifts can carry a delighted garden party up into the sky. So again, not only do you see this like physical segregation on a horizontal plane, again, arms one, two, and three where the wealthy are going to live, but in the story world of the novel, there's this vertical segregation that in these arms, the wealthy live in these connected buildings of glass tunnels that are 20 stories. So the wealthy are both physically and ideologically removed from the millions of impoverished inhabitants below. And these buildings are all connected by these glass tunnels, so the wealthy never have to step foot onto the street and share the same space um, as the working class majority. Um, to highlight one other thing, and again, it just shows the brilliance of Miller as an author and trusting the audience, because he doesn't hand us everything. Um, he doesn't make everything explicit. I'm interested in the way that green spaces function, even in this passage. Massive gardens on hydraulic lifts carry a delighted garden party up <coughs> into the sky. Having access to greenery becomes a mark of class privilege. From this very small t detail, we understand, or we should intuit, that climate change has destroyed the natural world. And this new um, technology that has been built is that gardens are now on hydraulic lifts that carry garden parties up and down. Um, this is just an incredible image in that um, also, of course, I should echo in the past when gardens initially um, in their dominant form were a side of the aristocracy and the wealthy, right? To have this space that uh, was just for leisure. It wasn't a working garden. It was just a, a space of leisure. That, uh, that the public, that the masses didn't have access to, that would have been open in common land, becomes enclosed for a private garden. I want to say a few more words about the geography of class in this novel, in this city. Um, as we discussed previously, this makeshift city is comprised of eight arms. Eight arms, one, two, and three, are where the wealth is concentrated, and the other arms are on the other side. So we have to read class both horizontally and vertically. Um, and we'll discuss that as we read this quote on page seven. On arms one and two and three, glass tunnels connect buildings, buildings 20 stories up. Archways support promenades. Massive gardens on hydraulic lifts can carry a delighted garden party up into the sky. So again, so finally, I want to think about the new formations of class and urbanization this novel is exploring. And again, this is exactly Miller's day job as an advocate working on, on 
progressive policies to alleviate the housing crisis in New York City. On page 31, we read, all cities are science experiments. Kanak is perhaps the most carefully controlled such experiment in history. In almost entirely free press, minimal bureaucracy, mostly mechanical, the city overseen by benevolent software. So much to unpack here before we move forward. Um, this profound um, insight from urban studies that all cities are science experiments, including Manhattan, Chicago, Los Angeles. Um, and despite the freedom it seems to have, right, an entirely free press, there's no official language. Kanak is the most carefully controlled such experiment. And this book makes us question, so where are real freedoms? Because we get fooled sometimes by thinking about free press or freedom of choice, right? The freedom to choose between 45 serial options. Um, is that really freedom? But probably the most profound um, profound insight, I think, in this paragraph thus far is that everything is overseen by quote-unquote benevolent software. And that adjective, of course, we should read ironically. There is no official language. There is no official anything. Kanak has no government, no mayor. These functions are fulfilled by a web of agency, agencies deputized by Kanak shareholders. There's so much to unpack about how class looks different. But what we should see first and foremost again is that this new science experiment which is a new class formation, is the illusion that class doesn't exist, as if there's no politics anymore, there's no government, there's no mayor, there's nothing official, there's no centralized government at all. Everything seems to be free. But rather than the, the illusion of freedom, though, is maintained by a web of agencies. Everything is software, um, which, again, you see the class, um, the class is made explicit because this web of agencies is deputized by conic shareholders. But what this novel, I think, brilliantly shows is that in the future, we won't see the owners of production. We won't see those who, are, who own the majority of the wealth. They have made themselves invisible and created a new urban space in which people are ideologically blinded to believe that they're free. Again, they're making themselves invisible. And as we read later in the novel, um, in fact, the wealthy even impose high taxes to make it seem like everything's fair. But the key thing is in the future, as you analyze this novel, if you want to take this route, is how the capitalist class has made themselves invisible in this time of still prolonged crisis because of climate change. Um, thank you. And again, I look forward to reading everybody's reflections for this week.